message that he's going to bring to us. And I hope that you will plan to come back and be with us next Sunday. Well, this is a picture of Hershey Park Arena. Hershey Park Arena was built in 1926. And at the time, it was a hockey arena. It's still, if I'm not mistaken, it is still an ice rink, although it's used typically now for public, it's a public venue. But on March the 2nd in 1962, basketball history was made in this facility. Philadelphia Warriors defeated the New York Knickerbockers 169 to 147. And on this night, there were five NBA records that were set. And most of those records were set by a man that many of us remember named Wilt Chamberlain. He was a great man of great stature. Seven feet, one inch, 285 pounds. He dominated his years in the NBA. And that night he scored 100 points, the only time that has been done in history. Some in this audience Remember the next closest man who scored 81 points named Kobe Bryant, who just fairly a few years ago retired from the NBA. But on this night, March 2nd, 1962, Wilt Chamberlain recorded history when he made 100 points. I only did that three times in my career. That's just a joke. But on this night when Chamberlain made 100 points, he also set another record, and he, the record that he set another record was that he made 28 free throws. That still is an NBA record. Others have tied it, but Chamberlain set it. He was 28 of 32, and if you just do a quick calculation, that's 88% from the free throw line. And the Knicks fouled him so much that night because they didn't really think that he could make free throws. But he was dominating from the field. But they didn't think he could make his free throws that well. In his two previous seasons, he had shot only 50%, around 50% from the line. But in his third season, he decided that he would change in his approach. So he began to shoot free throws as we call granny style. I'm not altogether sure where granny style came from, except possibly it's the long skirts that the grannies would wear that would have to pull them up some, and then, and then they, would, they would take their arms and they would then sling the ball with both hands so that it would reach the rim, and probably it would get what we would commonly call shooter's touch, or a better roll, because the trajectory would not be as strong as if you shot it overhanded. Chamberlain that night made 28 out of 32 free throws. In his fourth year in the league, he went back to shooting free throws the way he had done the first two years. And at the end of the lesson, I'm going to share with you why he did that. Matthew 4. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and followed him. In Matthew's gospel, he records the phrase, follow me seven times. Mark records it four times, Luke records it five times, and John records it seven times. And when Jesus asked these men to follow me, when he said that to them, I think he said was meaning something different than we mean when we say follow me. Usually if somebody says, follow me, or if I, if I say that to someone, I'm saying, when you get in your car, you follow your car, where you drive your car wherever I'm driving. Follow me. So we think of it in terms of directions. Follow me where I go is the idea. But when Jesus said that you need to follow me, he was saying, I think he was saying, as I understand it, he was saying, you need to drop everything and let me, to, let me control you. Now that's a whole lot different than follow me, the way I say it. 
follow me means you give up your rights. And I'm going to tell you something. Even for the apostles, I'm quite confident that that was a hard request. Now, what we read in may not seem like it was that hard of a request, but it was. And Jesus said, I want you to follow me. In Deuteronomy 1 and verse 36, Caleb was uh, given the land that God had promised him. And the passage in Deuteronomy 1 36 says that he followed or wholly followed the Lord. Which that passage is mentioned, I think it's mentioned in Numbers, almost that same exact statement is made about Caleb. And to follow God like that, a person doesn't exercise his own judgment or thought. When Jesus said, I want you to follow me, basically what he was saying is, I want you to come and follow me and I want you to do what I'm asking you to do. I want you to let, ha have control over them. I want to have control over what you do. And the same directive I think is given to all of us who want to please God because the passage which Anthony read in Matthew 16 says this, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I do not know if there is a more difficult directive in Scripture than this directive. Discipleship is hard because it denies what we want very often. Not all the time. We can be a disciple of Jesus and benefit ourselves. But generally what it does, it allows us and it asks of us something which we prefer not to do. May I ask you a question? Why, why do you do what you do? Most of the time, it's because it benefits you. Most of us aren't going to do anything that doesn't benefit us. Just think about that for just a moment. That, that's how marketing works. You know, if somebody's trying to sell you something... They're going to try to sell you something because they want to show you how it's going to benefit you. When I say the term 15 minutes, what, is, what does all your minds go to probably? 15 minutes can show you how to save 15%, right? Yeah, it's a Geico commercial. Why do they say 15 minutes? Because that gives you some benefit. They're trying to promote some benefit for you. Or, or if you typically go where, where my wife likes to go and where I like to go to is, is, is to Publix. And you know why I like to go? Because that's where shopping is a pleasure. And I like pleasure. It's a great thing. And when I go to the grocery store, I don't quite get what they're talking about. But it's a pretty good place to go. But it's because it has some benefit to us, right? You're in good hands, right? With all state. Well, why, why go to all state? Because you're in good hands. Now, that might not fly with others in this audience, but I'm just saying, if you're much on marketing, that's the way that works. That's why we do what we do. We like that. Back in the 80s, we remember the granny who showed up and said, Where's the beef? That was a Wendy's commercial. And the whole point of that was if you go to Wendy's, you're going to get more beef on your hamburger than if you go to these other places. And Jesus said to his disciples, you need to follow me. But the difference in that was, I don't know that they thought there's going to be some great benefit for them. I'll tell you what they didn't understand. And they would understand that more fully as they would spend time with their master. The books of Romans and Philippians and James and 2 Peter and Jude all tell us that the authors of these books saw themselves as bond servants. They saw themselves as bond servants. A bond servant is different than hired help. You may hire someone to come in and serve you. You, you, may, you may call someone and say, I need you to come to my house and do certain things for me. And if you do that, when they get there, you may say, here's what I need you to do. And they may say, well, I don't do that. You, you want me to come here and do this, but I don't do that. And they can refuse to help you because they're not your bondservant. But a bondservant can't do that. A bondservant is like a slave. A bondservant does exactly what his master says do. And these authors of these particular New Testament letters, not to say that the others didn't feel this way, but the authors of these letters identify themselves as bondservants of Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 15 talks about the idea of being a 
bond servant. We, we, we don't, I don't know that we've sung this song here. There's a song called Pierce My Ear. It is a great hymn. And we, I think, we could learn that pretty easily and it would be good for us to consider. But, but the idea is, it is, is pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door this day. If you don't have some context for this whole idea, then the idea of a bondservant really doesn't have the effect as I think it should. Every seventh year, when the seventh year came, those who were slaves were required to be set free. This passage from Deuteronomy 15, follow as I read. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, and from your wine press. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing this day. So that, that was the point. This is what was going to happen in this seventh year. It was going to be this release. And then the latter part of this says, and if it happens to you that he says, I will not go away from you because he loves you in your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door. He shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servants, you shall do likewise. Then the seventh year, you released your slaves. But if the slave came to you, if that servant came to you and said, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay with you. Then that's something that you can do. And my, my question this morning, what would cause a Hebrew slave to not want his or her freedom? You ever thought about that? We, we, most of us, if not all of us, are unfamiliar with the language. The, the whole concept is a little bit foreign to us from a practical standpoint. We, we've heard about these kinds of things. But I just want you to think about the mark. If a man or a woman came to the master and said, I want to stay with you, then the way that slave would be identified as this bond servant was the slave's ear would be taken to a doorpost. You'd go to the doorpost and you would drive with a hammer. You would drive the awl that you see here into the lobe of the ear. And then once that happened, then you would really, in essence, pull the all out and what would be left, as we might understand, would be just a bloody, gaping, and jagged hole. When healed, anybody could recognize. It's different than a piercing in the sense that we think of pierced ears today. The hole would be a mark of devotion and when a slave went to their master and said, this is what I want you to do to me. Then the master would take that slave and go to the doorpost and pierce the ear of a slave who said, I'm yours forever. Why would a slave do that? I think it's a great question. I if the slave said, I will not go away from you because he, he loves you and your house since he prospers with you. If he says that to you, he's going to say that to you because he loves you. And not only does he love you, he loves those things that, that, that surround you. He loves all of those things that being a part of that family means. And not only does he love you, but he understands that he prospers with you. And so that's what he wants. That slave is now living in self-denial, but he's living in self-denial willingly. And he's doing that for a greater good that benefits him personally because the master's heart is such that he wants him to benefit. And no doubt that's the way he treated, his, that's the way he treated slaves even before he had to make the decision. That's why they stayed. And so with that idea in our minds, think back, if you would, about what Jesus said. 
If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Go back even to Matthew 4, to that passage. Look what happened. Jesus was walking by the sea. He saw Peter and Andrew. They were casting their net into the sea because they were fishermen. He said, follow me, and I'm going to make you a different kind of fisherman. Look at verse 20. They immediately left their nets. You see that? They immediately left their nets. And then you get on down. He says, going on, verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and John. They were with their father Zebedee. They were also fishermen. The passage tells us they were mending their nets. You know why you mend nets? Because you can't afford to buy new ones. I, I don't know that I, I've ever done this, but I, I know I haven't done it, but I've seen my mother take old socks and she mends those socks. I'll bet you not many people in this audience mend their socks. You know why you mend nets? Because you can't afford new ones. And you go and, and you take advantage of that. And that's what they were doing. And yet, when Jesus called them and said what is obviously the same thing, verse 22 says, and immediately they left the boat. They weren't fishing. They didn't need to drop their nets. They were mending their nets, but they left the boat and they left their father and they followed him. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do they understand what it meant to follow Jesus, all four men walked away from the family business. Said, I'm going. Now, what does that practically say? And maybe more importantly, does, are we asked to do that? Well, well, yeah, we're asked, Matthew 16 says we're asked to do it. We're asked to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. He said, that's what he said to all disciples. And so when you get to a passage like 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul would say, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. And then he would say in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see yourself as dying daily. That ever cross your mind? You die daily? You, do, do we even take that seriously? I mean, that's what Paul said. And somebody said, well, well I, I don't live when Paul lived. I, I get that. But the admonition is an extension of what Jesus said. I mean, what Paul says is, I die daily. I have been crucified with Christ. So isn't, isn't there a sense in which, in a very real sense, in an obvious sense, in which all of us ought to see ourselves as dying daily? Am I wrong about that? Have I, have I misinterpreted that? Or is that not what I see? Why do we do that? Why would we, in essence, then make ourselves bondservants? Why would we say, pierce my ear, Lord? It's going to hurt. It'll physically hurt, but pierce it because I want everybody to know when they see me that I'm going to die daily because I'm yours. Why do you do that? I'll tell you why the bondservant did it. He did it because he loved the master. And you know why he loved the master? He loved the master because the master was all about benefiting the slave. That's why, that's why he loved the master. Why else would you do Why else, when you've been given your freedom, would you say, I don't want my freedom? I'm, here, I'm all in. Why would you, the only reason you would do that is if there was some benefit to you. And you know what you're saying is, I'm going to commit to you for the rest of my life. Wow. Now I want to go back. I'm going to go back to the story. I want to add another element to this, to the, the idea. Why would Wilt Chamberlain, 
in his fourth year in the NBA revert back to shooting free throws at a lower percentage than he had in his third year, which was identified in a very real way by the night he scored 100 points, making 28 out of 32 free throws. Shooting granny style. This is what Will said. I just felt silly shooting that way. That's what he said about it. When I asked, well, you know, Will, your, your, your percentage is so much higher when you shoot like this as opposed to, why, why don't, why'd you stop doing this? I felt silly. And if you look at the, the physics and, and really about it, I mean, it, may, it makes a lot of sense to shoot this way. Now, some of you in this audience this morning are, are presently basketball players. I'm still a legacy in my own mind. It's the way that works. But it takes, it takes some skill to even do it this way. Okay, I understand that. But if somebody could prove to you that shooting free throws like this would raise your percentage, would you do it? Or would you like Wilt Chamberlain to say, man, I just feel too silly doing that. I'm going to show you two other fellas. This is Canyon Barry and Rick Barry. Rick Barry played, I think, maybe 14 years in the NBA. This was several years ago. This is even, this is even before my time. I remember when Rick Barry played. I liked him as a player. And Rick Barry shot granny style. He shot almost 90% in his career. Now, 90%, for those of you who are, can't figure out the math, that's making 9 out of 10 free throws. I'll help you with that. Or 90 out of 100. Or 900 out of 1,000. That's a lot of free throws. Made. That's a lot of free throws shot. But he was a 90% free throw shooter in his career. And he taught his son Canyon, this is his youngest son, he, shot, he taught his son Canyon to shoot. Canyon played, as you can tell, for the University of Florida his final year. Canyon Berry holds the single season record at Florida for most consecutive free throws made at 42. 42. And when Kenya said, when my dad was teaching me, he said, I wasn't too sure about it, but I did it because he was my dad. And he said he would go to some arenas and he'd hear people laugh at him because of the way he shot. He said, I went into an opposing arena one night and as I was shooting, I heard two people talking and one was making fun of the way I was shooting and the other one looked at him and said, you need to stop laughing. He's making most of them. And Canyon said, I realized that it wasn't about style. When you're in a basketball game, it's about how many you make, folks. It's not how it looks. So what are we talking about here? Sociologists, well, sociologists don't identify this. This is a threshold. This is about the best threshold picture I could find. And all of you know my handyman skills. You're probably just impressed with the fact that I could even find a picture of a threshold. That's what that is. That's, that's this barrier. That's a barrier that, that, that's put between areas where you transition into, right? That's what a th threshold is. And sociologists say that there's such a thing as a high threshold and a low threshold. Low thresholds are what you've just seen. Low thresholds are easy to go over. High thresholds are harder to go over. If, if, that, if this step wasn't here and I was transitioning from the floor to the pulpit and that step wasn't there, I could make it, but it'd be a high threshold. You know, young preachers, they jump up from the floor up here. I used to jump up. If you'll watch a real older preacher, notice I don't put myself in that category yet, but most of them will work their way over. You remember Brother Goff when he was here? He'd come up here and he'd work his way over. He'd hold on to this and then he'd step up, right? You know why he did that, don't you? Because his years of jumping up to the podium are over. I may do that tonight just see if I can. So you may want to come back just for that. But that's the difference between a high and a low threshold.
some have a high threshold when it comes to denying self and taking up their cross and following Jesus. Some people just say, I just can't do it. It's just, the threshold's just too high. And it may be a result of peer pressure. You know, when I was a kid, when I was in Bible classes, when a teacher said we're going to talk about, about, about peer pressure, I used to hate that. Talk about it all the time. I'm sick of talking about peer pressure. I don't want to hear it. And then I got old and realized, yeah, I needed to hear that. That's why they talked about it, because that's what I needed to hear. Some of you can't deny yourself because you can't get over what others are going to say about you. So some of you can't get move in a, to, into a different area of serving God because people may laugh at you. You don't want that. And it's because in your mind the threshold is too high. That doesn't, that doesn't face some of you. Not a problem. Some of you, the threshold is you have family pressure. For some of you, you know what you ought to do. You, ought to, you know you ought to need to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. But the family pressure is too much. And it's a high threshold. There, there may be none higher. Forget peer pressure. It may be that you just, can't, you just can't overcome the family pressure. Or it may simply be that you can't move from, from this area of not denying yourself to this area of denying yourself simply because you're too, you're too involved in what the world offers. I get that. There, there are a lot of things the world offers that are really good. But Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. And there are others that have a, a low threshold spiritually. You, you have to decide, you know, wh wh how low is your threshold? A little ridicule, a little laughter, <laughs> a little make fun of you because you don't act or you don't, may I use the term, you don't spiritually shoot like somebody else and somebody laughs at you. Somebody says, well, that's silly to do what you do, if that's even a word that people use anymore. Is that enough to ambush your faith? Say it's silly? Or, or you're not like the rest of us? Silly? Really? That's enough to ambush your faith? When Jesus said, you have to deny yourself. And you have to take up your cross. I think, and it means a lot of different things, and I get this, but it seems to me that in essence what he's saying is, I want to take you to my doorpost, and I want to ask you a question. You want me to release you, or are you going to commit to me for the rest of your life? Because my household prospers, and I love you. See, that's the choice. If you'd have been living in Israel during the days of Moses and you came to a household and you saw all those holes in the doorpost, you know what you would have done? You would have stopped there and said, I want to meet your master. I want to meet your master. So the question that I want this morning, are you ready to drop your net? You ready to follow Jesus? If you have a low threshold and you understand that what Jesus can do for you is he can make you prosper. I'm not talking about necessarily in terms of what the world tells you, but he'll help you spiritually to accomplish things that you never thought you could accomplish. But you've got to drop your net. You've got to follow him. We would love to help you with that. Let, let me add one more caveat to this lesson, please. I know that people struggle. And sometimes things in our life that we struggle with won't allow us to look at the most serious question that we could ask, which is what I'm asking this morning. This is what I'm, I'm really talking about, the most serious question a person could answer this morning. But because there are other things in our lives that hinder us, and maybe overwhelm us is the more correct way to say that. It's hard for us to answer this question. I get that. I get that. You may be here going, Kenny, I know what God wants me to do, 
but I've got to deal with this in my life. This is, this, this is, the, prior, this is the overwhelming priority in my life. I want you to rethink it. I want you to rethink that. Because when you commit yourself to the house of the Lord, then everything you do can prosper the way it needs to. As hard as it may be. Commit yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow Him and drop your net. If you need to respond to the gospel this morning, folks, please do that. While together we stand and while we sing. The salvation in Jesus. That's the